You can have a seat. The uh, 20 minutes was actually a 10-minute break. Yes, I know, there will be a, a longer break before the concert at the end of the night. Wonderful to be with you again. I'm Kevin DeYoung, and I'm here with my friend, who you will learn much more about in the minutes ahead, Rosaria Butterfield, a friend, a pastor's wife, a mother, a daughter of Christ, a fellow North Carolinian, and... You are going to learn more about not just Rosaria's life, but what, more importantly, the truth of God's Word, which has been evident in a powerful way in her life. And we are going to talk about sex and sexuality and holiness and self-control. If there's a verse that sort of explains why we're doing this at a purportedly missions conference, I think of Acts 24, 24, after some days Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Felix had already put away two wives, had seduced Drusilla, beautiful princess who was some 30 years his junior and enticed her to leave her husband. And so he was in no state of mind to want to hear about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. And neither will many of the people to whom the Lord will call you to minister. And perhaps even in your own life, this is a word that you need to hear. Rosaria. Here's what, I just have one question from my phone, which is from a, a site I bet you don't frequent often, which is your Wikipedia page. Oh, no. <laughs> Here's what the first paragraph says. Butterfield, who earned her PhD from Ohio State University. It should say the Ohio State University. That's true, that's true in English literature, served in the English Department and Women's Studies program at Syracuse University from 1992 to 2002. During her academic career, she published the book, The Politics of Survivorship, Incest, Women's Literature, and Feminist Theory, as well as many scholarly articles. Her academic interest was focused on feminist theory, queer theory, and 19th century British literature. She was awarded tenure in 1999, comma, the same year that she converted to Christianity. A lot, I think, happened at that <laughs> comma. Can you tell us what happened? Oh, my goodness. Okay, how long do we have, Kevin? I, I <laughs> 33 oh, minutes. No. Okay. But All no right. one's counting. All right, well, um, yes, a lot happened in that comma. Um, I uh, was one of the first crop of tenured radicals. I was a lesbian, I was an activist, I wrote policy, I testified before the legislature. I helped create the world that we live in, the evil in the world that we live in. Uh, and I think about that every day. And after my tenure book was written, I was starting to write a book about basically why people like you all wouldn't leave people like me alone uh, to simply do what I wanted to do. And in the process, I met Pastor Ken Smith, who is the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church uh, in Syracuse, and his dear wife, Floyd, and they became my friends. And in the process of a friendship with a pastor like Ken Smith, as I'm trying to understand why people like you all didn't want people like me to live my life, uh, Ken led me through reading the Bible through seven times. And uh, in that process, we talked about literally everything. And at a certain point, I came to realize that Jesus was who he says he is that he is a resurrected and living Lord. And I came to believe that that was true, whether I believed it or not. 
So my question was, how in the world could this be good news? I came to the arrival that it was very good news for people like you, but I still didn't figure out how in the world that could be good news for someone like me. I believed I was gay, I believed gay was good, and that was an obstacle. So I'm sure some people would say or have said, but really, you probably weren't really gay or you weren't really a lesbian. And maybe that was, that was just a, a little phase and maybe even, you know, you were raised liberal Catholic um, and this is really who you are. Can, were you a, re a real lesbian, <laughs> if I may ask? <laughs> um. Okay, uh, yeah, I, you know, this is where, where I just want to quote Jane Austen. She said that her sore throats hurt more than everybody else's. Uh, that's supposed to be a joke, but yeah. I, you know, I mean, at a certain point, it is hard to measure feelings for sure. I am a very weak woman. Uh, the battle out of lesbianism was about as hard as I could manage it. I suspect the Lord was very gracious in not giving it to me harder than it could have been. But I say this, and I mean it. If I was lesbian enough to go to hell, if I had not repented of my sin, I was lesbian enough to have this conversation with you. And I, and I know that's a, that's a harsh word, but I love you. I am looking out at an enormous sea of students who could be my children. And what I want more than anything else is for your life in Christ to well surpass mine and Kevin's. I want you all to exceed us in faith and in godliness and in sanctification. And so to that end, I'm willing to tell it to you like it is. And then, so, amen. You, you talked about the importance of the church, the importance of your, of your pastor, and we'll talk a little bit later about hospitality, which you model so well in your life. And how then... Did this change happen? Was it very quickly? Uh, you've written about it at length and encourage you to find all of Rosaria's books. And we have the, the newest one on five, that go through five lies of our anti-Christian age, a wonderful book. How did the change happen and was it painful? Well, the change, the change was God's justifying imputation of the righteousness of Christ in my life. And that was a change, it's an act, it happened somewhere behind the curtain of this, you know, heavenly universe. And at that moment, whether I knew it or not, my nature was changed, right? So you are all born, I am born, everyone is born under the imputation of the sin of Adam called original sin. And for some people, homosexuality is a, a response to trauma, we know that. And for others, it is just the particular way that Adam's sin, either called original sin or sometimes indwelling sin, kind of thumbprints a person. Now, what we know about homosexuality is that it is a deed of the flesh. It is a deed of the flesh like any other deed of the flesh. Now, Freud would like you to think that it's a very special deed of the flesh and here in 2023, the United States government would like you to think that too. But biblically speaking, homosexuality is a deed of the flesh. It is forbidden in the law and it is overcome in the savior. Now, like anybody here struggling with a deed of the flesh, I think there might be at least a handful of you here. Uh, it's a bit of a bear, but it's made more of a bear in a world that tells you that is who you are rather than how you feel. So the way that you deal with a deed of the flesh, scripturally speaking, is through repentance. Repentance has six ingredients. And the very first one is the recognition of sin as sin. Now that took a long time. I, in fact, I, I used to tell people as a professor of queer theory, I was tenured in sin. Like how in the, you know, I, I had to undo a lot of what I believed to be true. It, it's a battle of the mind for sure. But here's what I know because this book I'm holding in my hand, this Bible, it actually knows me better than I know myself. 
And I trusted that, I believed that. So the moment I was justified, my nature changed. My feelings didn't, but my nature did. And after justification, you are called to the work of sanctification. Sanctification is a work. You are supposed to sweat and bleed and suffer. That is what sanctification asks of you. You are to drive a fresh nail into your choice sin every day, maybe a thousand times a day, and then get up tomorrow and do it a thousand times and, and one. And what I have seen in my life and what I've seen in the life of other people who have indeed beat a sin of the flesh is that if you are tireless in your pursuit in Christ through grace, Satan will get a little tired of you and move on. Amen. Uh, so this book, you're right, gives, knows us better than we know ourselves. And I would just imagine there's thousands of students here who could probably give the correct answer on a theological test, more or less, about this issue of homosexuality. We could put in the T, though the LGBT is, mm -hmm. is really something quite different that's gotten linked with it. But you could go to Genesis 1 and look at how God created man and woman in the garden for a unitive, procreative function that only can be fulfilled man and woman together. You can look at the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, which was many things, but one of them was homosexuality. You can look at the example of marriage that Jesus reinstitutes in Matthew 19 and Ephesians 5. You can look at the prohibitions against homosexuality in Romans 1, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Corinthians 6. It is actually not a hard biblical argument. And even many honest, queer, lesbian, gay, New Testament scholars, not at all Christians, will admit very plainly the Bible says what all of these crazy Christians think it says. But there may be people here who want to have, they're excited about Jesus, they love the songs that we've been singing, and you can point out those passages to them, but there's something deep inside them that wants to come to a different conclusion. Might that be a different kind of homosexuality, or might there be a way to just find a middle ground? What is so alluring about this, the idol of our age, and how would you speak to these many young people who are feeling that pull, right theological answer in the attic of their brain, but their heart is tugging them somewhere else? Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit like reading a textbook about cancer and the difference between that and sitting down in a doctor's office and hearing him say, yeah, pancreatic cancer, stage four. And so the, the issue, I think, first of all, is in your mind, do you actually believe that this book is inerrant, sufficient, and won't let you down? Do you believe that suffering and sacrificing and dying to self is your reasonable service? I mean, these are just, these are questions of the mind, and I think it's very important for young people to actually sit and think with them. Something that I tell my students all the time, and I believe it, I've lived it, I know it to be true, is that every other worldview on planet Earth will deceive you, but Jesus never will. But Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, is for you and it's for me, and what it says is that you are going to give glory to God with your life, whether you are saved from the mouth of the lion or sawn in two. And so I think it's important to be sober about that. But I also think in a missions conference, and I'm concerned about this, I've been here now for a couple of days, I've talked with y'all, I've listened to your music, I've listened, I'm concerned, and I'm gonna tell you why I'm concerned. Sin is not something to be trifled with. Okay, sin doesn't stay where you put it. You can't simply try to manage it or steward it or navigate it. And sin is sin. 
So when I hear people say same-sex attraction isn't sin, it's temptation, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And it will kill you, and it will kill your ministry. If you think that you're going to go out and minister to the nations and coddle us in like that. So let me explain to you what I mean. You can go right to James 1 if you want. Because they often will use James 1 to say, well, look, you've got this temptation. And, you know, Jesus was tempted in all ways. So, it, you know, I flee from temptation. You know, James 1 is talking about the life cycle of sin. You know, like those life cycles of butterflies? James 1, 13 to 15 is the life cycle of sin. Sin is an embryo, sin in its largest form, and then sin that is finally producing your death. Now let me ask you a simple question. When do you think you have half a shot of fighting your sin and winning? When it's the size of an embryo or when it's a giant? But here's what we have done to you. We've taken this whole generation and we've told you, don't repent of your sin. It's not sin. It's temptation. Flee from it. Uh, have somebody lay hands on you. Um, pray that the Lord will deliver you from temptations. Well, I am here to tell you that that is not accurate. It is not biblical. It is dangerous. It will ruin your life. It will ruin your ministry if you have that. You need to fight sin at its first moment. And its first moment is an internal temptation, what John Owen called indwelling sin. You know, indwelling sin is like the sin that's hiding in your, it's like the robber that's hiding in your closet. If you only have one strategy for sin or one strategy for not being robbed is you're going to come home and you're going to lock the door. Well, that might work, but if the robber is in the closet, that's not going to work. So what do you do with the sin that's under your eyeballs? What do you do with the sin that's there before you wake up in the morning? Well, what Satan would love for you to say is it's not sin, it's a temptation, morally neutral. Leave it a little space. And I will tell you that it will do eventually what all sin does. It will grow and it will grow and it will grow. And then someday it will eat you alive and take everything that you love with it. So fight your sin at the first moment. And don't listen to people who tell you that it's not sin. Because that's not biblically tenable. You cannot work it out in scripture. Now, I know that your generation has been told that. And you know how I know it? I'm one of the people who used to tell you that. Isn't that terrible? And the reason I did is because I was trying to coddle my own sin. I was trying to make a little room for it. This is a really important, and I agree with all of that. I agree with that, all of that. This is a really important theological point and practical point. So we, we need to make sure we understand and you understand what Rosaria just said. There's actually a significant difference theologically between a Roman Catholic understanding of sin and a Protestant, let's say a good, robust, reformed understanding of sin. It has to do with a doctrine called concupiscence. You can look it up in the Catholic Catechism. It's right there in black and white. A Catholic understanding says concupiscence is this, this tender box. It's this kindling, that's some of the words they use sometimes, it's this kindling that unless it is consented to by an act of the will, it does not become sin. So that's what Rosario is saying. You have these, these internal desires, it's concupiscence, it's there, maybe it's disordered. It's not sin until you, by an act of the will, say, I'm going to strike a match and set that on fire. Where the reformer said to a man and to a woman that no, those desires themselves, to desire an illicit end is itself an illicit desire is sinful. Now, part of the confusion is we use the word temptation in a couple of different ways. So we know that Jesus was tempted and yet without sin. She's, she's mentioned this Puritan, John Owen, who is one of the best people. He's not easy to read, but one of the best people you can read on sin and temptation. And he says there's a difference between temptation that is the suffering part and is the sinning part. 
You might think of it as external and internal. So Jesus had external notions presented to him by the devil in the wilderness. He was tempted. He was told lies that were a temptation, but they did not arise within him. So sometimes people, well-meaning and nigh unto blasphemous, try to describe Christ as if he had all manner of, well, he had sexual sins or he had desires or even sorts of phrases and things that I won't even, wouldn't dare to say publicly. That is not the case. He had external presentation, but not internally. And James 1 is the place to go. It's actually the same Greek word at the beginning of James 1, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. It's the same Greek word that's used later about temptation. So there are some trials that come to us, morally neutral, suffering, that are external sorts of temptations. And then, verses 14, 15 following, what Rosario was reading, are these internal desires. And it's so important to realize this, not just so we have our theology squared away, because it matters greatly how we help people and how we deal with our own sin. Now, here's the the question I want to ask you, because I think, and, and I haven't always been as clear in articulating that as I should have been. I think the desire that many people have is they sense, even in this room, there's going to be people who have those, and they, they're saying to themselves right now, but I didn't wake up and I don't want this desire. I've prayed every day for years not to have this same-sex desire, and I already feel terrible, and now you're telling me that I just sin, 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 sin all the time. What is the gospel hope for that person? Yeah, and, and that's where we all need to go to Romans 7. And think about what the Apostle Paul, as a Christian, says about unchosen sin. He says, why do I do what I don't want to do? It is not I, but the law of sin in me. And see, right there is that gospel hope. It is not you, okay? It is not you, but it is a competing law. And what Satan would love you to think is that it is you. Satan would love you to think that there's such a thing as a same-sex attracted person, that there is such a thing as a same-sex attracted pastor, that there's such a thing as a gay pastor, as a gay person. Those could be descriptors, but those are not what we would call ontological. They are not who you are, even though how they, they very well may describe how your original sin is pressing down on you. And that is where we remember that repentance is done unto life. We don't repent to repent, but we, 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 we recognize our sin, we feel sorrow for our sin, we confess our sin, we hate our sin. And there, here's the challenge, and I, it took a while, You've got to learn how to hate your sin without hating yourself. And then you turn from sin and you ask the Lord to help you cultivate what is good. You go to Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, the Lord has put away your sin. There's no hanging your head as a Christian. The Lord, if you are in Christ, you are justified, you are adopted, you are sanctified, you are a child of the living God. You already have been forgiven and you want to live in the newness of Christ so that you have liberty. But what that Psalm 103, 12 says is for every single Christian, today's a new day. The only person who wants you to not repent is Satan. And that's because he wants to tell you that it's discouraging, but just the opposite is true. You know what repentance says to a Christian? It says God was right all along. And my life is hidden with God in Christ. And there's no shame in being a Christian. And one of the things to remember is this call of repentance is the lifelong call for every Christian. So we are not talking about something that if you have a certain set of 
attractions no. than you have. This is all of life. And I just, I, I'm, I'm betting that your six things in repentance are from Thomas Watson I, <laughs> and who, the Puritan who has this powerful line, repentance is the vomit of the soul. Mm-hmm. Everything in you naturally says, no, it's not supposed to go this way. <laughs> right. This is going in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. But it's godly repentance unto life so you put your head on your pillow and there's this there's there is moral space that is to say to repent at the level of at first attraction or desire whether for a man or a woman mm-hmm. is is a victory that mm-hmm. that did not grow that that did not give birth to sin in activity and to death. And so that is part of the good news that you can then, like the Apostle Paul said, I'm not aware of anything against myself. Not meaning he was perfect at all, Mm -hmm. but I repent and I come before the Lord and I know a clean conscience. Mm -hmm. That can be and Mm -hmm. ought to be the normal reality for every Christian. And it's the first word of the gospel, repent and believe. So you can't be recoiling against the first word of the gospel. But I think it is helpful to really think, take stock, because in your day, probably in this very day, you've experienced both external temptation and the internal concupiscence or longing for sin. External temptation, it, you, you know, be like Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Uh, flee. That is exactly what you should do. And you know what? When you do that, you just check it off as victory. But as Kevin said, when you repent of the smallest inkling of a desire for that which God hates, that's a victory too. And a little bit like working out. You know, there is a certain metaphor of, uh, there's a military metaphor that's used. There's athletic metaphors. You need to become trained at fighting your sin so that you can be of good use. You can be light on your feet. You can be unencumbered. You can do the work of the Lord, calling other people to this glorious hope that is in Christ Jesus. And also, you can recognize that the Lord doesn't throw anyone away. So we live in a world right now where, I would say the twin sins of homosexuality and transgenderism are functioning as the reigning idol of our day. If the Lord tarries, this moment will be remembered in the infamy of Moloch. You know people who have already mutilated themselves in a desire to be to, to have a liberation that is, um, you know, really beyond our understanding, right? And we know that in the gospel, God cannot be mocked and he throws no one away. So in the New Jerusalem, anyone who has done that, anyone in this room who has done that, there is no shame and there is great hope because your body will be raised, glorified, just like everyone else's, and you will be the man or the woman you were meant to be. And that is the hope that is for you and for your friends and for this generation, but it must be proclaimed. Let me ask you to respond in our time. I see it's ticking down quickly, but we have a a little bit more. Let me ask you to respond to a few different kinds of responses, arguments that people may give. Someone may have in their mind this slogan and may say to you, but Kevin Rosaria, love is love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. True or false? Yeah, well, love is, um, it it is defined by the object of that love. Uh, You know, love is completely morally neutral, but what is that object of love? So if that love, if that love binds you and someone else to what God calls sin, then it is perverted and it is not love. But if that love binds you and someone else to uh, honoring the Lord Jesus, um, to fulfilling the mandate in uh, the, the creation mandate in First Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Genesis 1, 27, 28, then that is a good and godly love. Um, and so love is what it attaches to. 
That's good. Let me give you another one. So, so there are probably people here thinking, I, I, I agree with you, I think, and, and biblically, but look, I, I want to support my friends. And I have a lot of people who are into the, and think this way. And so that's why I put the rainbow flag on my social media profile. That's why I put pronouns in my bio. I'm not, I don't really agree with it, but I want to show that I'm an ally. I want to show that I'm their friend and I don't hate them. How would you right, speak to right, those students? Absolutely. Well, when I first met Pastor Ken Smith, one of the first things he said to me is, Rosaria, I accept you as a lesbian. I just don't approve. And that's a, that, you know, you're like, yeah, that's kind of from the dinosaur age, you could say that, because right now we are all downstream from the Obergefell decision, and with that, the dignitary harm clause that says you are harming people if you fail to affirm their LGBTQ plus dignity. And here's where it gets rough for Christians. There's no longer a place where Christians can hide on this. If you want to help people like the person I used to be, you need to stand firmly and firmly rooted in the gospel truth, which is there is no way that being an ally to sin would do anything but cement me even further in my sin. That would have enticed you. You wouldn't have gone, there's a church that has a rainbow flag? Well, I, I, would have, I didn't see any reason to have a church with, you know, like I, I was fine being an atheist, but no, I think that's right. And I think what you need to realize too, and I don't know if this is gonna make quite the sense that I want it to, I'm trying to communicate, but you, um, so let me, get, let me tell you a story about a friend, uh, Laura Perry Smalls, all right? She wrote a book called From Transgender to Transformed. She lived as Luke for over a decade. Um, and if you see pictures of her back in those days, um, you know, testosterone on a woman has a very profound effect. During that time, that very dark time, her faithful Christian parents prayed for her and prayed for her. They never called her Luke and they never used male pronouns. Now they weren't jerks when they went out, when they would go out to dinner, um, they would avoid using a, a something that would, would embarrass her. So instead of calling her Laura, they'd say, you know, honey, did you want the, you know, the hamburger or something like that. But they stayed connected without being indoctrinated. And when Laura committed her life to Jesus, when the Lord unscaled her eyes, she returned to the parents of her youth, of course, and to her church. And when asked, why aren't you going to some church where you can be quote unquote missional, she said, why would I return to the liars? These are the only people who didn't lie to me. So what you need to do is play the long game. All right, you need to play the long game. You need to pray for your friends and your siblings. You need to be connected to them without being indoctrinated. You need to think through the social obligations you have. Yes, go to birthday parties. Yes, Thanksgiving. Yes, Christmas. That's different from a wedding. Um, and, you and why is it different from a wedding? Hmm? I agree with you. Why is it different from a wedding? Well, it's different from a wedding because a wedding solemnizes what the Lord himself established in Genesis. And you can't redefine it. Um, and, but what you can do is by going to a wedding, you can be claiming to bless something that God doesn't bless. And by doing that, you are further entrenching someone into a sin pattern that moves very quickly. See, the LGBTQ, um, the, the movement of this uh, is moving very quickly today, in part because it has become the reigning idol of our day. That means it's satanic, okay? Do you understand that? That means that you are doing a, a pretty serious battle with Satan as you are desiring to, um, to save your friends as though from the fire says Jude 23. And one of the things that happens is the world tells us what words we should use. Mm -hmm. And it may feel impossible, but as much as you can, don't let the world tell you what words. So even if it feels awkward to say so-called marriage, it is something to hold on to. Because yeah. as soon as you say any combination of persons consenting of any sex is marriage, then automate, you Christians, you just have your marriage, we have our marriage. Even, we're probably not gonna undo the terms heterosexual and homosexual, but even those terms, now you're just in a category, heterosexual, homosexual, just two different ways of being. You're cis, 
you're trans. Mm -hmm. All of those, mm -hmm. those words which yeah. come to us and you think, well, this is just how we speak today, they carry with them agendas. Yeah. And it's the difference between loving your enemies and pretending your enemies are your friends. All right? You're actually called to do something way harder than just concede to the liberal communitarianism of your culture. You're actually called to love your enemies. And I am very confident that each and every one of you in this room knows what I'm about to say next. If you have a strong relationship with somebody, you can have strong words. But this is where you need to watch your social media stuff. You can, you can ruin your witness, uh, you know, in 180 strokes pretty easily. So build strong relationships with people. Build strong relationships with unbelievers because you are doing it in an effort to love your enemies. That might sound harsh, but it is indeed the language of scripture. It is what Ken and Floyd Smith did for me, and I am very grateful for that. You don't have to cheapen the gospel. It won't save anyone anyway. You know, having a bunch of people who commit themselves to a gospel that isn't true isn't going to in any way glorify God or, uh, or bless them or help them. And one of the things that you've done so powerfully, and we're running out of time, read it in her books, is, is the ministry of hospitality, opening your home. But not just that, opening your home and being a joyful, mm -hmm. God-glorifying, out-in-the-open Christian. Welcome to our home. We're so glad you're here. What we do before our meals is we pray. How can I pray for you? We have a devotion. We're going to have a devotion. To be, I think so often we are not sure that we want to be authentic Christians right. in front of other people. Right. And you know what? Just embrace the awkward. Okay, it's awkward. So what? But don't try to think at this moment that you can offload this on a program at church. This is relational. This is the hard work of actually being a Christian in a world that hates you. And you can do it. You don't have to be hostile just because the world is. And you can love through all of the barbs that people throw at, which <laughs> often will come Absolutely. in very emotionally, I'm gonna say manipulative, they may not mean it, but if you say that, you're pushing me out of the church. If you say that, you don't want me in your life. Or even worse, if you say that, I'm going to hurt myself. You can just say, I don't want you out of my life. There may be church discipline, I did, but I want you to hear the gospel. Of course I don't want you to hurt yourself. But people have human agency and we cannot take that away from them or allow those kinds of threats to determine what we say is okay. true. And we just heard a very powerful sermon uh, that made it very, very clear that God will use sin sinlessly, but that's not an excuse for any of us to sin by deceiving our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones. So last word for us, you have this 11,000 students and you do love them. I really do. You, she really does. As a mom, oh, grandmother, oh, almost yeah. getting Yeah, yeah, there. Both, both mom and grandmother. That's true. And you know that there are people who uh, are, are going yes and amen to what you say. They're not sure. Some of them quietly hate what you've been saying. And some of them are, are, are ready to break down in, in tears because they don't know what to do with their own desires, their own fears, their own hurts. What does their older sister in the faith want to say to them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to say a couple of things. One is I really do love you. And I really do want you to exceed me in grace and godliness. And I'm here to say that I am the chief of all sinners, so that probably won't be all that hard. But nonetheless, your job is to exceed every person you've seen on this main stage in grace and in godliness. And you will, you will in grace, do that by committing your life now to taking sin seriously, to, to driving a fresh nail through it every day and a thousand times a day and killing it until it's dead. But take what I say, take what Kevin said, take what everybody's saying on this main stage and, and look at the gospel, look at the word of God, be like a Berean, uh, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong. And the other is you are not alone. All right, Christians are not alone. The church is the family of God. That is not a slogan, that is real. And here at this, we are at this conference, if we can talk and help you connect 
with people in your zip code, we will do that. If you want to connect with me and others, we are right here. We know that God is for you. And while the battle is fierce, it's not always as fierce as it seems right now. So put your faith right where it needs to be in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do it not because there's some 12-step program, like, okay, I'm gonna do this for 12 weeks, and then we do it because, indeed, the tomb is empty. The Lord is risen. Amen. Join me in thanking Rosaria for being with us.